Good afternoon. Today is May 24th, 1999. We're at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. In continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, we have the um, ability today to interview Joseph E. Champagne. Good afternoon, Joe. Good afternoon. Joe. How are you? Uh, very good. Good. Can I ask you a few questions before we get into your history <laughs> and the right. war? Sure. Uh, do you mind my asking how old you are? I'm 74. 74 years old. And right. what is your current address? Natick, Massachusetts. And how long have you lived there? 42 years. And you are married? Yes, I am. Your wife's name? Barbara E. Uh, and do you have children? Yes, one daughter. Her name is Donna. And grandchildren? Two grandchildren. One boy, Christopher, and, and Nicole, uh, 17 and 15, right? Yeah. And were you born or brought up in Natick? No, I wasn't. And where no, were you? I, I was born in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Yeah. And you brought up there also? Yes, I was, yes. What was it like growing up in uh, Marlboro? Oh, it was very nice. I, I enjoyed it, you know. I went to broker school, had the nuns. We had French in, in the morning and English in the afternoon, the same subjects, uh, geography, history, arithmetic, and So before. each morning you spoke nothing but French? In school, yes. What mm -hmm. school was that? St. Anthony's. Was that in Marlboro? In Marlboro, yes. Now you said you had been in Natick for almost 50 years. Yeah. What was Natick like 50 years ago? <laughs> it wasn't what it looked like now. <laughs> no, it was, uh, I came here after I was married and I, uh, Natick was, well, it was starting to build up, of course, from after the war, you know, after World War II, and there was a lot of homes. When I got married, we, we lived with my wife's uh, family over on Sharon Street for about six years. Then we finally bought our own home. Did your wife grow up in Natick? No, she didn't. Mm -hmm. No, she was born in uh, Dorchester. Then she moved to Holbrook, then she moved to Marlboro, then they moved to Natick. And when you say it isn't like today, uh, what was a typical neighborhood like when you first moved into town? Oh, they wanted so many homes. <laughs> and uh, you didn't have, uh, you know, all the big stores like you have now, and the malls and all of that. You know, and Were you able to purchase a home through the GI Bill? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. And was it the home on Oak Ridge Avenue? Yes, it was, yeah. Do you remember what it cost back then? 15000 yeah. <laughs> Cape Cod, yeah. $15,000, right. and you used the GI Bill. That's right. Do you know approximately what your houses are going for today? Uh, about 185000 What was some of your background with your family. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had one sister and one brother. And where were you in the family? I was in the middle. You were in the middle. <laughs> right. And you went to Catholic school through what grade? Well, we started there at kindergarten, went through eight, so that was nine years. Did you speak fluent French? Uh, off and on, yes. Uh, sometimes in the home we did. But now I don't speak that much of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I could. I can still read it and uh, stuff like that, you know. Were your parents French speaking yes, at they that were. time? Yeah, they were French, yeah. Were they from Canada, from France? I think that's correct, yeah. I think grandparents were from Canada, I believe. From Canada. Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. Was the school predominantly French speaking also, background? Well, yeah, because uh, there was a French church too, St. Mary's Church. It's up in Broad Street in Marlboro, it's still there, mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, the school I went to was wooden school. It was all built in wood, it was three floors. It was all nuns. And then over on the side, they had the academy, which was all for girls, all made in brick. That was the uh, St. Anne's Academy. You probably might have heard of it. I think that's moved in Paxton now, I think it is. Okay, and is St. Yeah. Anthony's no longer open as uh, a school? It's there, they made a new school. They tore the old one down and put a new one. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's been maybe five, six years since it's been closed. They do have a big hall. They use that for entertainment and parties and stuff like that. What types of nuns were they? St. Joseph's. St. Joseph. Yeah. Um, after parochial school, you said through eighth grade, where did you go to school? I went to uh, Marlboro High. And what year did you graduate? Uh, I didn't at the time. <laughs> I, I quit in my third year, my junior year. I was working at the time after school at the Marlboro Wire Goods. And so I, uh, I quit school to go to work to help 
family out. I was kind of after the, after the depression, you know, it was, things were tough. <laughs> Did that happen with a lot of your friends oh, too? Oh yes, a lot of them. Oh yeah, a lot of them stopped school or go to work to help out their families. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had the welfare and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. you, I, know I remember my father was working as a shoe in a shoe shop. He was making like 12 bucks and a half a week, you know. <laughs> That, that was nothing at that time, really. Everybody was in the same boat, so. Sure. And you know, we had to go down and get food and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I know many times they had the, uh, like in uh, Woolworths, they used to have those, he probably, this man might remember that, was uh, they used to have these rubber soles you put on your shoes when you, when you uh, got a hole in them. Cardboard used to go inside, too, a lot of times. <laughs> because the shoes wore out? They used to wear out, that's right. And you yeah. couldn't afford new ones. No, that's right. And mm -hmm. I wasn't that on what my brother was. He was he was really tough on clothes. He was younger than I was. And now, he passed away on, on us, yeah. About 15 years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Suddenly. Now, how old were you when you entered the military? I was 18. Right from work, you made the decision to enter? Well, I, when, uh, I think it was Wake Island or one of those islands. Uh, a couple of my friends, their, their brothers were in the service and they were killed over there in the Marines. So we went into Boston and tried to enlist and uh, I got turned down once in the count of my eyes and then I went in again later on with a few of the others and I got turned down again because I had a hip out of joint or out of place or whatever, you know, which was proven because I went to see a chiropractor after so I wanted to make sure that they were right. <laughs> So were then, you, were you disappointed when you kept was, getting yeah. turned down? I was because a lot of my friends were accepted, yeah, in the Marines, yeah. So that when I was drafted in '43, I uh, I went for my physical at Fort Evans, and after going through the physical, there was like a colonel, a captain, you know, there's three or four of them, all different branches, sitting at the table, and they say, "Where would you like to go? Which service?" So I I says, "Well, the Marines turned me down twice. I says, forget them. I said, I'm going in the army." So that's where you know I did. <laughs> and yeah. you you chose the army, right? Because they were also choosing you. Yeah. I, well, yes, they were. <laughs> yeah, because I was drafted. Yeah. And um, at that point, had most of your friends already gone into yes, the quite service? Yes, quite a few of them. Yes. Had. And most into yeah. the Marines. Well, no, a lot of them were in the Marines, but a lot of them were in the Army, the Navy. They were all spread around. Yeah. You know. And where did you have your basic training in the Army? I had my basic training at Camp Wheeler, Georgia. Macon, Georgia, yeah. Camp Wheeler? Camp Wheeler, right. Yep. Had you ever been outside of Massachusetts prior to this time? Uh, New York, Boston. I mean, not Boston, it's Massachusetts, yeah. <laughs> New York, uh, maybe Pennsylvania, something like that. That's did you I had gone. find it very different in Georgia? Oh, yeah. It was in very, what way? Very hot and humid. Hot and humid. It was very hot. When we used to go out and uh, march and stuff like that, they used to, when we came in for, for dinner, they had salt tablets on the table, you know, with this, this uh, glass holder. They wanted to make sure that you got plenty of fluids back, you know, and the salt and stuff in your body because it provides so much. Now, when you were in Georgia, were most of the gentlemen that were with you in the Army from all over the U.S. or from specific no. areas? At that time, uh, most of them were from uh, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Vermont, mostly New England, because that's where uh, they were, they were this, this division, 43rd Division I was in, was drawing their personnel from replacements. Can you explain replacements? That's a term that a number of past <laughs> yeah. interviewees have uh -huh. used, and I think yeah. someone listening to this tape might need to know what that means. Well, I, I, I believe a replacement, as I was, and many of us, we went overseas and we replaced the, the men, women that were killed, wounded, sent home, you know. So we replaced them so that they could build up the regiment of the division again, so mm -hmm. they go back and battle again. Mm -hmm. yeah. How long were you in basic training? From June to uh, October. What year again? 1943? Yeah, June 43, right. Were you able to develop any close friendships in basic? Yes, I had a lot of friends there. In fact, when we got through basic, we all took each other's names and addresses and stuff like that, you know, and we kept in contact for a while, but after a while, a lot of them were, you know, 
moving around different places and, you know, kind of forgot. When you had any kind of leave or time off, did you go into the area towns and mingle yeah. with some of the people from Georgia? Well, we used to go in town, yes. We'd go into Macon and uh, on the corners they used to have, uh, down south, they used to have watermelon stands and uh, peaches and pecans and stuff like that, you know. But uh, we didn't mix too much with the families. We more or less stayed together, you know, the group I was with anyhow. And of course, for I'm Catholic, and we used to go to church in the base, or so we went in town, one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I made a lot of nice friends. You know, they were nice people. What did you um, have a specialty that that kind of came out in the forefront during basic, or or after that? Yeah, well, when we were uh, down at Fort Devens, then we all we moved to Camp Wheeler. After we were there for about three or four days, they had everybody fall out, you know, the, before we started our, our basic training. And they said the name, they called off names, and so they tell you to step forward, so you step forward. We didn't know what was going on. <laughs> we thought they were going to discharge us. <laughs> <laughs> you no, were hoping. <laughs> we were hoping, yeah. No, but they, uh, so what they did, all of those that stepped forward, we were in the communications uh, section. Yeah. <laughs> And did you, do you think you were chosen for communications because during training that seemed to be appropriate for you? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It could have been the test we took or something like that, you know, because uh, I was glad to be in communications. I enjoyed it, yeah. In fact, when uh, we were in training, uh, we used to, in communications, our, 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 what we had, we used to sit under the pecan trees. Mm -hmm. and, well, we had the same training as all the others after that, but we had some of our training on radio, and we had telephone, switchboard. We had to learn all kinds of different ways to uh, send messages, or like if we were stuck outside, we used flags or stones or, you know, anything we could get a hold of. To. It all depended on what the situation was, you know. And we code, learned how to code and decode messages by cryptography on a little, we had a regular coding and decoding machine, it's a little box. Did you find that interesting? It was, I enjoyed it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we took Morse code because we had radio on that, so. Mm -hmm. We started with the Morse code, the dots and the dashes, and just, as you get improved, they keep moving you up, you know, to, to you're know, going real fast. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed that. We were inside on that, you know. And uh, we were right next to Robbins Air Base, and planes used to come in and land. And, the fellows, uh, the servicemen uh, in the Air Force used to do guard duty during the day, walking along the fences and that, because we were right to, that's all it was, was the fence support uh, between us. <laughs> and uh, we used to say, gee, hey, look at that, they're doing guard duty day time. We did it at night, you know, we used to do that at night. We had to draw guard duty, you know, and, uh, but they walked around with gas masks and everything, you know, they were still prepared. They were prepared for yeah, anything. Yeah, for any, any emergencies, yeah. After basic, yeah. what was your first duty station? Uh, Fort Ord, California. And how do you spell that? F-O-R-T, O-R-D. It was in California, yeah. California. Monterey, Monterey, California. And what was it like going to sunny California? Sunny California, hmm. When I first got there and they passed out, uh, well, more, more clothes and stuff and rifles, which we didn't have a basic training, it wasn't our own, you know, we had to turn them back in. But they gave us our rifles and all that. And we, we were going through the line, getting all this stuff, and all of a sudden he hands me a comforter. You know, they handed us everybody a comforter. You know, look at the, <laughs> look at the sergeant, and I says, what's the comforter for? I says, this is California, it's real hot. He says, oh, you'll be glad you have it, because the nights get very damp and foggy, and it's cool. You're right by the water, Monterey, Monterey Bay. And I was glad I had it. Mm -hmm. And when you woke up in the morning, everything was foggy. You couldn't see nothing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that, about 10 o'clock, it went up to about 100 degrees when the sun came out. So that's the way it was. When we marched, we went out marching with the, you know, full field packs and rifles and all the other things we had on us. Uh, we stopped marching the, on the hot top. The hot top was so hot it would go right through your shoes, the bottom of your, of your uh, shoes, you know, and also the sand. 
Sand was so hot too, you know, 100 degrees or more. Yep. How long were you at Fort Ord? October, October to, let's see, November, December. Yeah, first part of December, I guess it was. And when you were doing all of this marching and preparation, mm -hmm. did you know at that point in time where they were going to be sending you? No, we didn't know, no. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we were going down towards Camp Wheeler, we all thought we were going to the Air Force and head down to Florida. <laughs> all of a sudden, the train would turn the other way. <laughs> we ended up in Georgia, which is next door anyhow. Sure. And after Fort yeah. Ord, where did you go? Well, for about a month, we ended up at Camp Stoneman, Pittsburgh, California. That was uh, all muddy. I we didn't care for that. But it was all mountains and mud. And we did all our training, you know, uh, going on the firing line and all that kind of stuff, you know, marching, going through the, uh, the tear gas bit, you know. They what was that like? Tear gas, they put you in a room, a great big room, and everybody gets around the room, and they, they have a big can in the middle of the room, and they take and they light it up, and you, then you have to put your gas mask on. If you don't get it on, your eyes get very teary. They don't let you out either. <laughs> they let you out after about maybe if you get real bad, then they'll open the door, let one, you know, let person out. But you have to really get it on there right too. Some of them, you know, you wouldn't get it on right, you wouldn't be able to breathe. You know, you still get that gas up underneath the mask. And then once and you get outside, how did you feel? What's that? Once you get outside oh. after that. Oh, <laughs> you try to get some some air, you know, because your eyes are all teary and everything else. So it took about 10, 15 minutes, you know, you'd uh, feel a little better after that. And yeah. once you've done that and done it successfully, did you have to continue to do it over again? Oh yeah, they'd do it every once in a while, they'd make you come back in again, sure. Mm -hmm. Not right away, but you know, some other time. Were you able to help a partner if they, if that person had a difficult time, or was it well, sort of that they, you were on they, your they own? They didn't want you to, but I mean, you, you did if they were really having trouble, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were there yeah. for about a month, and you yeah, said it was Camp very Storm, hot, yeah, right. yeah. hot and humid. Mm -hmm. And then where? Then we bought a ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did That's you get any time off between? No. No. The only, well, the only time off I had was between Camp Wheeler and Fort Ord. Mm -hmm. I think it was two weeks. Yeah, we took the train home, and we left from Boston. We went right straight to the Fort Ord. Yeah, we stopped in San Francisco overnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Saw the Golden Gate Bridge and the cable car and the turns around the top of the hill. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, you know we had all this all this type of training. You know that uh, everybody all the same ones had. You know on the firing line and marching and putting tents up and all With, that kind was of. Was there ever a feeling thing, like you know, okay, let's get going this. under the infiltration course? You okay. know, but live ammunition going over you. And that's Close where, calls that, on that. That's where I bump, bump my up my nose. We were down in a trench in back of it where they were, they were firing over us with live bullets from the machine gun. And every fifth bullet was a tracer. And you can see it at nighttime, you know. And we were going down and the man in front of me stopped and we had a head sound. I banged into him and I cut my nose. <laughs> so I went through the infiltration course and I got, and they're firing all the time. You have to go on the barbed wire and get your rifle through without all that business, you know. You got on your back and everything else. Any way you can. I mean, they're, they're also shooting off uh, like hand grenades or something's going off, you know, make explosions, you know, so you, you don't know where they're going to be either. And uh, I get through the course <laughs> with all the others, and uh, I said to the, the sergeant, I says, My nose is cut. I said, I think I banged it against <laughs> my helmet. He said, I'll go see the medic. So I go see the medic. He says, Oh, I don't know what to do with that. I've only been here for two weeks, he says, in the medical corps. So I put some sob on the band aid. <laughs> That's why I still have a scar there. <laughs> and even though this was practice, it was with real bullets. Were oh, there, oh, yeah. Were, oh, were there any fatalities during sometimes, that time? Sometimes there were. Yeah. So and a lot of times, uh, like when you toss the hand grenades, you have a hand grenade, you pull the pin. If you let that, if you let that handle go, there's a handle that comes down, like a door handle almost. If you let that go, that'll go off in about. I don't know, four or five seconds. It's not very long. As long as you hold the pin, that's the uh, handle down after they pull the pin, it won't go off. But once you let go, and some of them would go to throw it, you'd have to throw it and, let, and fall down on the ground. And a lot of them would uh, sometimes just slip out of the hand and go backwards, you know, and everybody would fall to the ground. 
Oh yeah, you had all kinds of different things happening. <laughs> so even you though this know. was sort of practice mm. for the war, it yeah. was still a very scary oh, time. Oh yeah, that stuff was live. It could kill you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Even uh, the, the some of the men with their rifles, you know, they, some of them get excited or something instead of keeping it up in the air or down on the ground, they kind of point it to it. The sergeant would scream at her, you know, don't do that, you know. And then we also had the bayonet training. You had to take the bayonet and jab the the dummy or whatever they call it, you know, and pull it out and go to the next one, and climb up over up over barriers and get down on uh, on the ropes, rope ladders like, yeah, all that stuff. Swing over water. So water what, fell in the water. What <laughs> would happen if someone in your unit didn't make it through this training? The training. As far as I know, wow, well, when I wasn't at Camp Wheeler, as far as I know, we all made it. As far as I know, we all did. I don't remember anybody that was, uh, you know, tossed out or anything like that. You know, it didn't pass. So then you, um, in the beginning of 1944, actually, or the very end of 43. Yeah, December 24, 1943, we landed in New Caledonia, the day and before Christmas. <laughs> and can you tell for those who will be watching this where New Caledonia is? Uh, so we're not, it's over in the Pacific area. It's right before, wow, well, New Zealand, Australia, and a few others there. Yeah. How long were you on the ship it's for? A French, it's a French island, Numir, Numir, Caledonia was. How long was we there? How long were you on the ship? Oh, oh. going over. Let's see, well, we, we left. I would say about a couple of weeks. What was that like? Well, it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Uh, the food was good. It was <laughs> fresh food you got. And uh, yeah, during the day we'd get up on the deck and you know all you could see was water anyhow. And they had other ships around you. You weren't just the only one, you know. And they had transports on the side in case of any plane come along and tax or anything Did like that. Did you see you know. any planes coming? Not at that time, no. Not How did you spend your days? Well, we'd get up on the deck and we did ex make us exercise and and they also gave us some booklets to tell us where we were going and what to expect, you know, the people there were French and they might have some uh, Indians or whatever you call them, you know, that were there, uh, what do they, they call them, not Indians, I forget, something like that. They they, uh, they told you more or less what the how the people lived there. You know, it's was like a little a city. You know, it wasn't like me in Boston, but <laughs> and uh, we when we stayed there, we were up on the it was a hill. It was a big hill, and there was a long, long tent. There was I don't know how many, and uh, while we were there, the typhoon came, and. <laughs> It rained and rained. When it rains there, you know, a typhoon, you know what that's like. <laughs> and it, it blew so hard, the tent started to pull up. So we all went outside and trying to hold the thing down, you know. We were drenched anyhow, so <laughs> we tried to hold it down, but it, uh, you couldn't really do it that much. And was this your first experience in a typhoon? Yeah, yeah that was the first, yeah. Was it a scary time for all of you? Yeah, it was. Yeah, the next day everything was flooded there, I remember, because we went down into the town and. Yeah, I so, never went through one of those before. <laughs> and it lasted for approximately one night, or yeah, how long? it was all one day that day. It was, but it kept raining, you know. But it wasn't that hard. The wind slowed down and everything. So was this going to be your base camp for a while, or was this just no, sort of a passing through? Yeah, we were just getting landing, you know, and getting there, you know. As I say, when we first landed, that was the day before Christmas, forty forty three. And they passed all the enlisted men out a uh, liter of beer, you know, the dark beer they have over there. And all the officers, of course, they all got, they all got whiskey and rum and whatever, gin, you know. So we took our beer and it was so hot anyhow, so we stuck it in the ocean and tried to get it cool, but it didn't do too good. <laughs> when you mentioned that the officers yeah. got the hard liquor, right. what was the sense of your group when they would see that you would get warm beer? They weren't too happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, of course, the officers always get the best anyway, you know. But we were, were, we were, were happy. Were you able you know. to befriend any of your officers at all? No, not really, no. Mm -hmm. And your group that was in New Caledonia, how, how many were there, approximately? 
Mm. Probably about three, four hundred, probably. Because mm -hmm. we're all going over as replacements to this outfit. So once you landed and you got through the typhoon, mm -hmm. then what? Then we got aboard another ship. <laughs> I have all the names written down somewhere there. And one time we got on or whatever. But uh, we got on the ship. And uh, I think, believe that was the, the one that time when there was a storm coming up. And they knew it was coming. And we started off and the, the ship was going up this way and down that way and that way and that way. And so everybody started to get seasick. <laughs> because uh, we were down below the deck, way, way down. We were down the bottom, I think. And of course, we had all our baggage with us and everything else, and our helmets, we all hooked our helmets on the side of the side of the cot, you know, the bunk, whatever they call them. And you had three or four lined up, one, you know, on each side. And uh, when everybody got sick, boy, <laughs> you use those helmets. And I know I remember myself and a few others, we went up on deck. And this was in the night time it happened. But, you know, when it was starting to get real bad. And uh, I remember I was sitting up on deck, I was soaking wet because the waves were coming up over the ship. And I was sitting there, and there were other people were up there too. And this lieutenant came along and he says, he, sa he says, you're all wet, soldier. I said, yeah, I know that, sir. <laughs> he said, you should go below and change your clothes. You know, every we were all sick, so, you know. So after a while, I finally went downstairs and I did change my clothes and a few of the others did too, you know. But those waves were so bad, they were coming right up over in that storm. I don't want to be seasick again. Mm -hmm. You know, you go down to the mess hall and you look at the coffee and the food, it looks great. You can't even drink a half a cup of coffee. You can't eat anything either. You feel like it, you know, you get real hungry. Mm -hmm. So that's about three or four days that finally everybody started to eat finally. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's an awful feeling. And where did you land after that period of after time? After that, we landed in New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yeah, Auckland. Auckland, New Zealand, yeah. Do you remember what struck you first when you landed there? <laughs> we were glad to get off the ship. <laughs> what was the but weather was, like when you arrived? The what? Weather. Oh, the weather was nice there. Yeah, it was beautiful. Auckland, New Zealand was nice. We all got off the ship, I remember, and then the, um, we were put into some tents or something close to town, and a day or two later, we, I have a picture there somewhere, uh, they, they lined us up and we, we had a uh, parade for the, uh, all the, the generals and the, the colonels and the people of Australia and New Zealand, you know, and the military and the politicians, and they reviewed us, you know. I have a picture there somewhere of it. And then we went back to our tents, and then later on they moved us out we went about 40 miles out of Auckland, and uh, we ended up in Wakwit, New Zealand. Do you know how to spell that? Yes, W-A-R-K, W-O-R-T-H, New Zealand. It was up where the mountains were, and they had like a camp there. But they had set up in little, they were little uh, cabins, like they were four to a cabin, two on each side of the cabin with our, all our clothes and all our gear there and rifles and so forth. And we trained from there. How long were you there for? Let's Approximately. Hmm. I got it all written down somewhere. But I see we got to forty-four. I think it might have been about three months, three or four months at the most, I think. And, and we had good food there. That was fresh food. We even had ice cream there. Really? It's just like you get in the in the pharmacy or something. They had those big, big. Uh, buckets like, you know, and they used to scoop it out. We had a lot of lamb. Of course, uh, New Zealand is a lot of lots of lamb and sheep, yeah. And the food was great. continuing to train? Yeah, we still train there, oh yeah. Yeah, we used to train up in the mountains there, you know, and march along the road and with our full field packs and so forth. And then uh, we used to get into town every once in a while. And we uh, stayed at uh, a couple of us, they, I know a friend of mine, a fellow by the name of McLean, we stayed at this one house and uh, it was about 10 miles from there, I can't remember the name of the town now, and I think the family's name was, if I remember, was McDonald or something like that. And we stayed over there, we paid him so much, you know, to, to stay there. And 
in the morning they give you breakfast and we had coffee and they have eggs and they have potatoes and they have sausages and oh God, they had so much. And no matter what you ate, you're full and they want you to, they want you to have some more, you know. And uh, <laughs> we just couldn't eat any more. They were real nice uh, people. So they welcomed you? Oh yes, they did, yeah. And uh, of course the outfit had already been to New Zealand in that same area before they had gone off to, to fight in uh, New Georgia and Wonder and they, they were all over. That's why I needed all the replacements at that time, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had been there before and then we, they had dances and they used to play Boston Matilda and the Amazing Grace and, <laughs> and they drank tea because of coffee. They couldn't make a good cup of coffee but tea, you know. Yeah, and we used to go get the restaurants, we used to get, uh, they used to call the Stike and Eggs. You know? Instead of steak. Yeah, yeah instead steak. of steak. Steak, mm -hmm. steak and eggs, yeah. That was a good meal, really. And uh, yeah, they, they, they welcomed us, they really did. Did any of the men uh, get serious with any of the women over there? Or? Oh, some of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Some did, yeah. We used to, we also went to, I remember one time we went to a golf course and just fooled around hitting the ball on the golf course and chasing it around. <laughs> Yeah, just to have something to do. It was, it's nice, nice stuff to see over there. Of course, now there's lots more too. Now, during yeah. that period of time, were there ever any enemy planes oh, not, nearby? Not there. Or? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. So after because the they they had taken so many islands, you know, so they were, you know, far off at that time. So after the three months or so that you were yeah. there, um, where were you sent after and then that? Then we went to uh, New Guinea. We, we landed in uh, Itope, Itope, New Guinea, A-I-T-A-P-E, Itope, New Guinea. It was by the Drinamore River, D-R-I-N-I-M-O-U-R River. Uh, I think the, another place we had been, we were at, was Wewak, W-E-W-A-K. Are these areas where you actually came upon direct combat, or? Not yeah, we did there. Yeah. What was it like for you? The Japanese were on one side of the river, we were on the other side. <laughs> yeah, we we dug in and we uh, set up a uh, an area for ourselves. And what we did was we we dug foxholes and we we put them up. We put some uh, wood up off the ground and we put our pup tents over so that because you get the rainy season, it rains every day there, and. Uh, so we were up there in case, you know, when we put the mosquito nets, kind of the mosquitoes, there was lots of malaria over there. And uh, and then if, you know, any planes or anything came over, we would just roll roll off into the, into the foxhole, you know. And Which even was though, either under it or beside under it, it? Yeah, under, under it. it. Mm -hmm. Even if it was half full of water, <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> so besides yeah. water, was there mud? Oh, there was mud, there were snakes, there was mosquitoes. There was uh, crabs, all kind of things, yeah. You never know. Scorpions, yeah. when you take your shoes off, you had to check them in the morning, make sure there's no scorpions in them. They could kill you. And, <laughs> and, and you, you talk about this so lightly, but was it of concern to you, or was it just something you had to live with? Well, it's something you have to live with. You know, it's like somebody goes camping, you know. This was happening every day, you know. Mm -hmm. Very seldom we got inside, you know, in a building or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was always outside almost every day. Sure. We were lucky at that spot because we had we could put up, you know, little pup tents or something like that over us to protect us from some of the weather and that, you know, the rain and, yeah. And how long were you in combat in that area? We were there till last part of December. Just about. Yeah, probably about the second or third week in December. So that's over seven months, am I thinking correctly? Yeah, about that. Yeah. What was that like for you? Well, um, it, got, it got to be natural, you know. Yeah, you, uh, you went out on patrols and, you know, you see the Japs across the river, they'd see you, you know, they'd, they'd, go in there one, they'd swim in there one side of the river, which you on that side, you know. We wouldn't bother them too much sometimes, you know. But every once in a while, like in the evenings, they'd, they'd pull these bonsai attacks, you know. What would and a bonsai they, attack be like? Well, they make all kinds of noises, they scream and they holler and they come firing at you, you know. 
with their, their guns and that, their rifles and machine guns and mortars and whatnot. Would they cross the river? Oh, they, they tried to, yeah. They would try. And of course, we would set up there so that we could, we could stop them, you know. I don't think there was too many to buy <laughs> at that time that I remember. Yeah. I remember one time, uh, Bob Hope, you know, he uh, used to go around to all of these military places and uh, what he did was, uh, he was going to be in, uh, in New Guinea, Hollandia, I think it was, and what they did was they drew names out of a helmet to see who would go. So my name got chosen. <laughs> Mine was one of them. So when uh, it was time to go, we had a rain for about two or three days. So the bridge got washed out. We couldn't get to see him. <laughs> they couldn't get over the bridge to see him. So I never saw him. So you never Except got on to TV. go. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. And then, did you move out at any special time, or did you basically stay in that area? No, we stayed in that area. Yeah. Now yeah. was because was there were other outfits down in Hollandia and different places too. You know. Was your purpose to hold that area? Yeah, we, we were more or less holding the line there. Sure. What do you remember about that time? What sort of stands out in your mind? Well, we, we had the we had some uh, some of the planes came over and dropped you know a few bombs or something like that. But uh, we saw quite a few of them. You know, they, as I say, they were trying to get come across in the evening. You know, because that's when they did a lot of their a lot of their fighting. Because figured you didn't know where they were. <laughs> you and couldn't see them anyhow. They they were so good at camouflage. I mean, they they didn't dig a foxhole like we did, like you know, long and narrow, you know, like that, like a box. They used to dig like round like this table here. And they were so good when they cut out that grass or whatever was on the top, they would get down in the hole. I don't know, one, two, it all depends. And they drop that top of that grass right over. It. You wouldn't even know they were there. You could walk right over them. You wouldn't even know that. You'd go right by them. And then you'd run caves and different places like that, too. So you never knew when to expect to come no, upon them? No, you didn't. Yeah, of course, uh, you, they, uh, they, they start, uh, of course, they, they were there for a long time, so they could really build up a lot of defenses there, you know. So we had to really push to get, you know, any, get five yards sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And when you were on duty at night, knowing that some of this was yeah. going to happen at mm -hmm. night, were you able to talk with the oh. other members of oh, your... Well, we we talk, but it wouldn't be very loud, or we mm -hmm. just whisper in you know, to each other, something like that. Yeah. Do you but remember... But if anybody opens up, opened up with a rifle or a hand grenade, they thought they saw something, the whole line would open up. You know, machine guns, hand grenades, mortars, everything would go, you know? All you needed was one, one shot, <laughs> that's all, or a hand grenade. Like, sometimes it might be a cow or a, a caribou or something. You never know what it is. It could be an animal, you know, you never know. But it was something you heard in the river yeah, or in right, that area? Yeah, right, right. Or it could have been a civilian or something. You never know, you know, walking around. Sure. But they, somebody opened fire, they see somebody, you know. Yeah, and the whole line would open up. Yep. And I know that um, prior to going on, Tape. You had mentioned that you had been wounded. When did that occur? That that happened in the Philippines, uh, March 14, 1945. So after New Zealand, you then went on to the Philippines. We went to the Philippines, right? Lingayen Gulf, January 9th or 10th, I believe it was. Of 45. Of 45, right? Yeah. Did you know where you were going at that time? Yes, we did. How did you feel about going from one section and being in combat yeah. to then going yeah. right into another situation like that? Well, they they uh, told us, you know, where we're going and what the situation was, and that we would be closer to, to occupying Japan, you know, knocking them out of the war, you know, finish the war off, and. Uh, we had bulletins and, you know, bu little booklets that told us about the people in the Philippines and what they were up against and all that. Of course, we would, we would get newspapers from home and stuff like that. So, and they also used to put a, give you a sheet of 
sheets of paper, you know, letting you know what's going on in the war in the Germany, you know, and in the Pacific area. And so we knew more or less what was going on. But they told you all about these people, you know, what, what to expect, you know, when we got there. Yeah. Was it what you expected? Uh, yeah, I was. <laughs> in what way? Yeah. Well, I know when uh, we, got, we were getting off the ship, as I say, we trained going down those ladders, those uh, rope ladders. When we got off the side of the ships and they had these little LSDs and boats down the, the side of the, uh, the ship, you climb down there with your four wheel pack, your rifles, everything, you know. And if you miss, well, you land them in the water. <laughs> but they put, you get, they get you on there, you probably get uh, 30, 40 people maybe. It all depends how much they held. And then what they do is they, they get out, out in the ocean so far out, and of course the ships all stay there. And then they, the ships start firing their big guns off, their big cannons and stuff like that. And then you got the planes going and they're strafing and they're dropping bombs, fire bombs and whatever, you know, the boat types. And then you get out there and you circle around in these things. And what they do is you're going in the wave. Going about, you have like the first wave, second, I was like in the fourth wave, I think I was, something like that. And you just keep circling out there and of course the Japs are shooting at you too, you know. They're trying to hit hit those boats and they won't get in there, you know. And then you hit the beach. That was on the fourth wave, about I would say. And uh, they, you see the damage that the the uh, cannons have done from the boats, you know, the the ships, and the strafing and the bombing and on the planes. And then you, there were some civilians there, and you see some of the houses are all knocked down, the trees are gone, you know. And uh, then you see some of your buddies, you know, people you know, you know, army people laying on the on the ground, they're either dead, wounded, or then some of them didn't even didn't get off of the off the LSDs because you know some of them they when you, you they try to rush up and the Jap, Japs have got machine guns or something or whatever, you know, they're hitting them as they land on the beach. So yeah. they didn't even make it off the boat, some or of them or no, once they no. got on the beach, they mm. were hit there. They were also. hit there, right? Yeah. And those who might be wounded, you still had to go by them in order to? Yeah, we did. We just hauled for medics, yeah. And the medics would come up and they'd take care of them. Did you get a different sense there than you did, for instance, in New Zealand? Oh, yeah. Oh, New Zealand. Mm. Oh, New Zealand. Was, that was like Boston. That was, Peace. that was great. Yeah. Peaceful and quiet. We just trained there, that's all. And, and, yeah, and it was nice. This was, you knew was sort of the real thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was much different than what we were in New, New Guinea too. Yeah, because we were actually trying to take these mountains where the Japanese had uh, these big guns and caves. They had uh, used the first cavalry horses, and they had them pull all these rails up into these caves, and they they put the railings in there and they put the guns on the rails. So that what they did was they brought these big guns out up in the mountains there. They fire a couple of rounds off. And then they'd pull them back in. You couldn't find them. And the planes used to go and, and strafe, you know, and drop bombs and try to get them, you know. So, and all the time, the infantry and you know were trying to get up the hill, and you couldn't because they're looking down on you. I remember one, uh, one mountain. They, uh, I think it was Company I captain. They told him to get up there and take that hill. And he says, "I won't take my men up there again." He says, "That's suicide." So they sent him back to regiment from the battalion, and they put another lieutenant or captain in his place. Finally, got the hill after a while. I mean, out of the mountains, got them, got the Japs out of there. Finally, got them out. Another time, I remember we were doing that, and uh, they had the tanks. Used to follow the tanks, you know, side back, whatever, right on them. And they pulled up in the bottom of the, the mountain. And they were firing up there, trying to, you know, find, pinpoint where they were, trying to get them. So they were coming out of the uh, the cage while the men were charging up the hill. And then I remember they pulled back, and we we were behind them one time, and the uh, cannons were coming out and firing over the tanks. And I ate a lot. Of, we all ate a lot of dirt that day <laughs> because those things were going out right in back of us. And uh, I was glad when that was over that day. But then the next day you start all over again. You know, you take a little, you lose a little. You start up again. Yeah, that's the way it worked. 
And at this point in time, you're all of the age of about 20 years old? Mm, about that, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, in the Philippines, right. And how long were you in the Philippines for? You said you arrived in January of 45? January, January 45, and I got wounded in March. Yeah, that was just three months. Tell us about that. Yeah. Uh, I remember a lot of these uh, towns we used to go to. There was no town, really. Everything was just gone down. The um, trees were all gone, you know. There's no green on them or anything. They were just knocked off from the shellings and stuff. And, uh, uh, I, re I remember one one night that uh, the Japanese were, uh, we had dug in for the night and we were right along the edge of a road, like it was like a road, and it was all over there. It was all rice paddies and stuff, you know. The rice paddies is goes up and then down and up, and, mm -hmm. and there were some, we had some Filipino guerrillas with us, a few of them. But uh, this this one night they they came down the road, and we were laying right by the road there. We had dug in, and I remember uh, they had tanks with them. You could hear the tanks, and of course. Usually we had a couple of men out on the flank way back to let us know if anything's coming. You know, they're supposed to call in. But of course they couldn't call because they, they found the wires and cut them. <laughs> so I remember we used to take shifts, and usually two of us in the fox or one, one would stay awake while the other one would try to sleep, even if there was water or whatever there was around, bugs in the hole or whatever, you know. So I remember it was my shift and I, uh, they came along, and I remember looking up, and there was a Jap looking right down at me, and I thought I had it then, <laughs> you know. And but they went by, and then we opened up on them, and we got a couple of them that night. Do you but think he saw you? Got, oh, he must have. He was looking right at me. I was looking up at him. I had my knife. I had my rifle, but I also had a knife too. <laughs> what What I do you think ready, made him case. not? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it was in my time. The good Lord was looking after me, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always said when I was over there that I wanted to be home by 21 years old. I made it, but at least I made it. Mm -hmm. A lot of them didn't. So yeah, that was one, and so that same spot, I remember, I can't remember exactly where it was. We moved back. It was a little hill, a little knoll. So the lieutenant says, uh, I think we better move back up there in case they come back. So we moved up there, and we dug in up there, and we put two machine guns, 50 caliber, plus we had 30 calibers, rifles, pistols, everything, hand grenades, whatnot. And we put them crisscross like that. So if they got down between us, one of them, one of them is going to get them, somebody is. <laughs> so they came down that road the next night again with the tanks and that, you know. You could hear them coming, you know. So when they got down so far, I think uh, they didn't uh, cut the wires that evening, and they they warned us that they were coming along. Of course, you could hear the tanks anyhow. So when they got down, we let them go by us. So when they got by us, the whole line opened up. You know, machine guns, hand grenades, mortars, anything we had. <laughs> so I remember all night long, there was, I don't know if it was one of our men or one of the, uh, the Jap, they kept on mourning all night long, you know. So you don't know, you know, how badly they hurt or anything like that, whether it was one of your own men, you know. He kept going, whoa, 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 you know. <laughs> so when it finally got light in the morning, we found about eight of them there. And they were Americans? Huh? They were Americans or were they Jap No, no, they were Japanese. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that one of us grown had got a 50, 50 caliber shell across his mouth and hit a couple other spots, yeah. But we didn't want to suffer, so we took care of them. <laughs> In what way? Well, you, we killed them. You did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> did that bother was, you at all, was or was dead. it something that you felt you had to do? No, he was half dead anyhow. Mm -hmm. He was going to die. Mm -hmm. And there were, the others were, were dead, most of them. Mm -hmm. Almost all of them were dead, except that one, I think, was groaning all night, mm -hmm. all evening long. And I don't think any of our, I don't think any of our men could hit that evening. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I think that's where I got the Japanese pictures off of one of the, the men's pockets, you know. We went through their pockets. They had, they had uh, watches on, you know, American watches. Of course, a lot of them probably were from California at one time. A lot of them went to college out there in California and different places, you know. Mm -hmm. When the war broke up, they threw all the Japs in the concentration camps, like, you know, they watched them. 
But they had all American uh, watches and all kinds of different things. So I, I got some uh, photos of this, must have been his family, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I got a flag at that time too, he had in his pocket, yeah. And then we picked up, uh, there was some uh, information from one, one was an officer, he had some information on, you know, where they were going and what some of the things they were going to do, you know. So we turned that into the captain and they sent it back to intelligence, you know. To decipher what it yeah, would say and where they were going. Yeah, figure it out, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this, a lot of this would happen in the evening? Yeah, what, a lot of it. What was yeah. your day like? Well, the days we kept marching, we kept going into different, going uh, in. different towns as we went along, you know, different towns almost every day. And, and during that period that, of time, those towns were gone. They, the towns were gone. But what about the town folk, the people that were? No, they weren't. They weren't any around. They'd all gone they'd up gone. in the mountains or somewhere, you know, just to get out of the way. Yeah, they had gone. We only saw some of them when we first got on the island. Mm -hmm. I didn't see many after that, except for the Filipino guerrillas. Did you get a sense at that point in time that war, the end of the war, was imminent? Or, or did you not well, know that at well, the time? Well, we were kind of hoping it was getting close, you know, mm -hmm. because we, we heard about, uh, uh, what is it, VE Day? I think mm -hmm. it was over in, in Europe? Germany and Europe, mm -hmm. yeah. And then, uh, yeah, because we had radio, you know, they'd tell us what was going on. Uh, and then uh, we, we went along, and so we were trying to get, uh, get to Manila, because that was where a lot of them had gone. They kept pulling back to Manila. That was supposed to be one of the last strongholds, and they were, they wouldn't give up there. So you knew you were attempting to get there, yeah, but it we was were, a slow process. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We had we had about three quarters of the island by that time. But uh, we were heading for the. We ended up. We went to. We stayed one night. I remember by Clark Field, over there in the Philippines, and we dug in, and <laughs> I remember that that evening the. Jap planes came over and they were dropping bombs, and somebody says, "Don't worry about them; they never, they never hit you." <laughs> we were far enough away; they didn't bother. You know, we could hear them dropping and falling, but we stayed right now. Oh, we didn't bother them even moving. You know, we stayed right there anyhow. So tell us about that March when evening. you mentioned yeah. earlier that that's when you were wounded. What yeah. lead us up to what had occurred? Yeah, we were at that time. I remember we were heading for the uh, Ipo Dam. That was a big water thing for Manila. That's where they got the water out of, I believe. And I remember we were heading for that. And at that time, I had been uh, transferred out of the communications, out of the message center, because a couple of corporals came over for, as replacements another time, you know, right before we had, uh, after we had, had landed on uh, Lingang Go to replace some of them. So a couple of corporals came over and. Myself and another person that was in the message center, we got tossed out into the pioneers. <laughs> it was altogether different. You know, we were doing communications, you know, radio and switchboard and all that kind of, you know, decoding, decoding messages and what have you. So at that point, yeah. having been through what you had been through, were you upset that suddenly you weren't doing any of the communications y anymore? Yeah, I was. We were, yeah. And we just got tossed out because we were PFCs and they were corporals. Uh -huh. So they just pushed us out of there into the pioneers. Pioneer sector, yeah. Yep. We weren't happy about it, uh -huh. but you couldn't do nothing about it, you know. So now you were, I mean, you were in the trenches anyway, but yeah, even more right. so yeah. now that yeah, right. you were. Yeah, because they, what they did, the pioneers, they went and they, uh, they were helping the, the build roads and, uh, you know, knock down different things over there, buildings, and we, uh, we were blowing up ammunition that they got out of the caves, and, and we used to go into the caves and see what they what was inside the cave. Once they, once the Japs were out of there, we'd go in and look around and see what they had. And we were blowing up, we'd get all the ammunition out and stuff like that. And we'd throw it in a big uh, hole, you know, where the bomb made a crater or something. We'd throw everything in there. And we'd blow it up with C2, which was like a looked like a uh, a, a butter, you know, a pound of butter. And you take that and you throw it in there and we'd run like heck and, and hit the ground. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would blow it up, you know. Mm -hmm. And we used to look in the caves and see what they had. And I, I remember one time we found some sake in there, one of them. And uh, <laughs> so that, that evening, the, a lot of the fellows were drinking the sake. It's like gasoline. 
God, we used to put in a, we put in a canteen cup that's in the black. But they, they, they had, you know, had nothing to drink for so long. They drank some of that, and some of them were going after each other with their bayonets, you know. They got a little. <laughs> we had to, we had to pull them, pull them away. Mm -hmm. Wow, some of them they get a little too much. They get, you mm -hmm. know, they get wild. When, when you mention uh, finding things in the caves yeah. and then putting it together and blowing things up, mm. prior to this interview, one of our um, other veterans had said not only would they find things left over from the Japanese, but also yeah. from, and you mentioned Clark yeah, Air Base. Yeah, Clark right. Are, uh, they didn't specifically mention Clark, but mm. they mentioned other air bases where they may leave some of the planes oh, or yeah. plane mm -hmm. parts. Did you yeah. come across any of that? No, I, I didn't, no. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't come across any of that, no. Mm -hmm. No, as I say, we were just there like overnight Clark Field. We got there during the daytime, and mm -hmm. then at the evening, then the next morning we pushed ahead again. Sure. You know, trying to go up and catch up this some of the other divisions that were up there too that we a couple of times we switched around you know like the first cavalry I know was there and uh, I think the 24th I think and 33rd we used to keep swapping around every once in a while we, we did that when we come off the line we'd go up and for a little while then we'd come back again you know now, was General MacArthur involved in any of your day-to-day -day operations? Oh yeah, he was the uh, he was the head one of the uh, Sixth Fleet, but it was an Admiral Halsey, I think it was, was one, I think. But, but were you? We didn't see him. You no. were we distanced never, from yeah, them. Yeah, we never we never saw them. Mm -hmm. Like when he came in on on the Lady, but well, we were on Ruslan then. By that time, when he came in, I mean they show this, you know, on TV they show him coming in. Yeah, I have returned, you know, but they don't say there's fifty thousand soldiers. It went before him, you know, because he wouldn't be on the beach taking the taking the picture on a camera, you know, mm -hmm. coming in. If there was any any Japs there or anything, you know, he don't tell you that. <laughs> sure. No, he was a good general. He knew what he was doing. And, uh, of course, the admiral, as I say, he had a lot to do with it too. You know, Admiral, admiral Halsey. I think, it was Halsey, I think mm -hmm. he was. A, and of course, our general, we had General Wing. We saw him once or twice. Yeah. He was from Vermont. He was a nice guy. Now, were yeah. you on Luzon when you were wounded? Yes, I was. Tell us about that. Yeah. Well, uh, I think it was around, I, from where the paper I got with the Purple Heart said it was around Pasig, P-A-S-I-Z, I think, something like that. And we were going for the Ipo Dam, as I said, the water supply there from Manila. See, Manila was, uh, the Japs would keep pulling back towards Manila. That was more or less the last stand mm -hmm. in the Philippines there. And uh, I, re I remember we were up in this mountain, and uh, I was in the Pioneers then, and we were going out looking to find some more caves, you know. So there was myself and another fella, and I think there was two others. They went, we split up, and two went one side, two of us went the other side. But the other people were up in back of us. Anyhow, we were supposed to let them know if we found anything, you know, by the firing shot or whatever. And uh, I started down this hill, going down this hill, and I don't remember getting hit really, because I I got hit. And, uh, I had my I had my rifle, my carbine. I had my finger on the trigger all the time. I was looking around, and uh, I got hit in the kidney. I got hit in the hand. And I got hit in the kidney at the same time. So I didn't see who what hit me. So I. Uh, I, was, I laid back, and I hauled medics, and I hauled two or three times or so. And I also heard some of the fellows on the other side, maybe the same ones, you know, the other couple that went down the other side. I couldn't see them, and they couldn't see us, but they were hauling for medics too, so. Uh, I found out later I could hit by a 25 caliber machine gun bullet. Was it above you or below you? It was you below me. Below. I, I can still, I think I can see, almost see them down there. Mm -hmm. It was down at the bottom of the hill by a tree. And there was a couple of them there with the 25 caliber, but in all that time there was a Piper Cub flying around, American, you know, flying around, and it was about 100 degrees. And when I got hit, first thing I, you know, of course I was hit in the hand, the blood was spurting out. So I, I reached for my uh, medical pack in the back, with a little pack we had with some kind of powder or medicine to put on, and keep away infection and stuff. So I. I uh, put some on my stomach, and 
that I remember on my hand. I put some there too. And uh, so then finally, <laughs> a couple people came down. A couple of soldiers came down. One was a medic, I guess, and one was another a rifleman, probably. And he started to put some, he put like a patch on me or something, you know, for now, temporarily, he stopped the bleeding and that. Of course, I was so dry, and I didn't know I couldn't drink water, so he, he just took his canteen, and he, he just wet, wet my handkerchief or something, put it on my lips, you know, to, just to damp it, because he didn't know how badly I was injured. And what I did is I had a clean, I had a clean handkerchief that morning. It just happened that way. I don't know how, but I put that in my hand, you know, because I was hit. I was hit right in here, and it came out right over here. You can see the little scar there. Mm -hmm. And it pushed my knuckle back, because I had my hand in the trigger. And it pushed my knuckle back here. It's way up here. And these fingers are still numb, these three. To this day, they still are. 54 years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're still numb, yeah. And I can't straighten the finger out either. So you had some nerve damage. Yeah, right. Yeah, they put, a, they put. When I got to the hospital, they put. They put me in a. Uh, a uh, um, cast, and they put like a, a wire around, and they put an elastic on it to straighten that out. You know, after they operated on my stomach, and they removed my right kidney because it was so far gone, the bullet went right through. So they had to remove it. It was. It was damaged. You know, they couldn't save it. Between the time you got off the hill, or while you were on the hill and they were still mm. sort of patching mm. you, yeah. were you uh, wide awake? Were you? I was awake, yes. Yeah. yes you I weren't was. in shock see, at no, all? No, I could see that plane flying around up there, that Piper Cub. And when they came down, as I was saying, they started to bring me up, back up, and one of the men got hit in the neck. So he went back up, and so did the other fella. So I was still laying there. <laughs> And then a couple more came down. I think there was more than that. There must have been three or four, I think. Because they came down, and that time there, they put me on the poncho. And there was a lot of brush and stuff around there. I was very picky, you know, and like a, like a rose bush almost, you mm -hmm. know, all that kind of stuff. And the stuff was only this high. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't jungly in that spot. So uh, they, they rolled me over on that, and well, before that, they had a shootout uh, smoke screen. They shot smoke screen out. And then they started to bring me up again. Then another fellow got hit in the thigh. So, so he went back up and they sent another man down. So they kept, they shot some more smoke screen. I think I was there maybe a couple of hours probably. I, I estimation. I mean, and then the one fellow says, well, we're going to put you in this poncho, and you care whether you, you know, we, we scratch you up or anything like that? I said, no. I said, get me the hell out of here. <laughs> and so they did. We started up the hill. They shot more smoke, smoke uh, screening, and finally they got me at the top of the hill. And there was a, a uh, jeep there with, uh, they had the uh, stretches on the side, you know. And the, when I got up there, they gave me some uh, plasma. I don't know, so many, so many points they poured into me. And then uh, they kind of patched me up a little better, you know. And they put me on the side of the Jeep, and they took me down the, down the hill. I ended up in a uh, uh, aid station, you know, uh, like a mash. Mm -hmm. And in that spot, I was the only one in that one. I don't know if there was any more right close by. But uh, the doctor looked at me, and he says, You've been hit pretty bad. I said, yeah, I am. So he looked at my stomach, my my kidney here, and my hand. So first he passed up the hand <laughs> a little bit, you know. And then he says, uh, we're going to operate on you. He says, he told me to turn on my side. And he says, count, you know, he gave me an injection. And he says, count the so-and-so, you know, tied backwards or whatever. The hundred or backwards, hundred down, I don't know. So I didn't get very far. I was out. <laughs> and then when I woke up in that, it was like a uh, a big long, almost like a ranch, only a big long thing, you know, like they have in camp. And when they did that, I I was in there, and I had two two medics, and they were really great. And they, 
I used to ask, my, wet my lips because I was so dry I couldn't drink water, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a kidney. So they uh, they wet my lips and they gave me penicillin shots. And uh, so the next day <laughs> we were there and they also put a mosquito net around so the mosquitoes wouldn't get at me. I was, I was lucky up to then, I didn't have malaria or any other problems. So the next day they brought this Japanese guy in, uh, he was a prisoner, and they put him way down the other end. <laughs> and he kept moaning all the time, you know, he had malaria. So when, after a couple of days of that, I says, uh, <laughs> I says give, me a, give me a 45, I'll put him out of his misery. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would have too after what they did to me yeah. and all my buddies. But I was that they, they finally They finally moved him though after a while, yeah. They moved him out? They moved him out, yeah. And then, and then uh, every evening the Japs would take a shower right over that, that area. And one of the uh, corpsmen says, uh, he says, we have foxholes outside. He says, if you want us to move you out there, he says, we'll take the whole cot right out, you know, and everything, just put it right in the foxhole. He says, but they never hit the place, he says. <laughs> That's okay, we'll stay here. If we're going to get hit, what's the difference here or there? You know, mm -hmm. I've been hit so once. you were still in the MASH hospital, oh, yeah. the MASH unit. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> were, did you know that you were only going to be there until you were able to be moved, or? Yeah, that, right, yeah. I was there about a week, 10 days, probably. I was there. So your kidney was removed right. in my that? Right, my right kidney, right. Because it was shot from the front to the back, yeah. They cut me from here to there and over there to there, way in the back. <laughs> and the funny part of that is when uh, when my grandchildren were young, we were up in Maine and we were going swimming in the pool there. My grandson was probably about eight years old. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he says, Grampy, he says, since you got two belly buttons. Uh, I says, no, I haven't, Christopher. I said, that's where I got shot in the war. Oh, he says, because <laughs> it's belly buttons there. And it's like, with a bullet when it was over there, but it went out the back too. But then it cut me, you know, up and down. <laughs> it just kind of struck me funny, you know. Yeah. And then but, once you were um, able to be moved, yeah. where did they move you to? Well, <clears throat> they moved me from there. That at that time, I believe they had already taken Manila. They had an awful battle getting that because they even they even fought. I have a tape at home. They even fought in the uh, the ball park, you know. And the bleachers and all that, you know, they were, they, the Americans had to crawl underneath fences and all that kind of stuff to get to them. But they finally got them out of there. But I ended up in a, a, a hospital in Manila. I don't even remember the name now. I was there a short time. It was a nice hospital. It was all marble and everything. And the Americans were there by then, you know. They had moved up. And I stayed there for about, probably about a week. And I'm sorry, where was that again? That was in Manila. In Manila? Yeah. What was the medical care like there? It was very good. Yeah, they were good. And you were alert and awake? And oh, yeah, all the time, yeah. Were you walking mobile at that point in time or not no, quite yet? No, not yet. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, I stayed there, as I say, about a week or 10 days uh, offhand. I, I think around that. Then uh, one day they, they came and they cut me. <laughs> I don't know who took me out. Somebody took me out. and I ended up uh, at a small airport. And they put me on a plane with some other uh, soldiers who were wounded. And uh, we, they flew me from Luzon to Lady. And is that? That was another part of the Philippines. L A I T E. L E Y T E. L E Y T E. Thank you. Mm -hmm. They took that part first before we t went to, uh, to uh, Luzon. See, there's Lady's here, and then Luzon's up a little further. They flew me there, and I was laying flat. On the, on the stretcher in the plane. And I remember one of the corps men coming along and asked if I was okay. I said, yeah, fine. I said, I feel a little cool, so he threw a blanket over me, you know. And they were, the medical personnel were great. Mm -hmm. They were. In fact, the doctor that operated on me sent the letters to my house back around 1949. And, <laughs> and my wife and I had just come back from our honeymoon and, we get back to my my mother's house, and she said, "You got a letter from the doctor in uh, I think it was Iowa." And uh, I opened up the letter, and he, he says, 
he wrote to my mother, you know, he says, like, I just want to know how long your son lived, you know, from the operation I gave him. So he didn't expect He didn't you... expect me to live that long, you know. Mm. So uh, that was nice, just come back from my honeymoon, <laughs> you know. <laughs> my wife says, what? <laughs> so anyhow, I wrote him a letter back myself. I wrote him and told him I was doing great. I had gotten married, you know. And so he wrote me again another time, and I wrote him that I was doing great. And then I think he either retired or he passed away or something, and his son took over, and he wrote me once, I remember. Mm -hmm. And I was still around. <laughs> so I wrote him and I thanked him for everything, you know. And Looking back at I your injury, really are, you, are you surprised that you did so well? Well, no, I, always, I took care of myself. You know, I always did. I, it took me a long time to, you know, try to, uh, you know, take a shower or anything like that. I was always afraid something was going to happen, you know. Sure. <laughs> when I took a shower or something, you know, I might have problems, you know. But after a while, I got, I got over that. Now, yeah. when you, after you got to Leyte, yeah. did they then fly you home to the States? No. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to go before a board, just like when you were in the service. <laughs> yeah. we, went, we went before a board. I believe there was a colonel and a captain, lieutenants, you know, and so forth, and they asked you questions, you know. And there's a, there was a whole bunch of us, and the fellow went in before me, and he had lost a finger or something or other, and they flew him home. <laughs> I went in, I got a kidney miss, and I got my hand in a, in a, in a cast, and the banjo or whatever caught up with my finger out in the last thing, and they talk it over, and they said, well, he can go by ship. <laughs> so they sent me by ship. Yeah. <clears throat> so one day we got, you know, they got all, uh, I don't know how many we were, they must have been ship full, you know, one of these hospital ships. And uh, they give you a name tag, I got all that over there. I have it at home, name tag and what's your name and what's wrong with you and all this and that, you know. So you get in the line, they call your name out, you know, and you go on board ship, and they tell you where you're gonna be. So we got on board ship, they must have been, I would say maybe 500 men, you know. You know, the ones that were wounded, they fill the thing up. <laughs> Of course, that was in 45, right before the end of the war, you know. And I think we were on board ship like about three weeks from the Philippines, from the Leyte. And we pulled in the harbor, it was in the evening, and we went to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And uh, when we got there, the next morning we find out, they tell us they're not going to take us off. <laughs> And we said, after three weeks on board ship? <laughs> on our way, oh yeah, on our way also, I believe, uh, no, that was after I think what happened was, we, we had stopped at the, uh, in Hawaii, they, they pulled up along the dock, but we couldn't get off. So there was a bunch of kids there, you know, and they were selling papers, newspapers, and, you know, money like that. And we, you know, we, we'd throw them some money off the ship. So I, I, I ended up getting a dollar bill that says Hawaii on it, and I had a newspaper of the day, you know, and I guess they'll get that at home too. But they wouldn't let us off the ship anyhow. So we start off again. <laughs> That's to be another three, three weeks in the boat on the ship. So we, we said, we're going to go now. So we start off. We ended up, we went through the Panama Canal. That was, that took a whole day or two, you know, getting through there because they have to, let the water down, let the water up there, blocks, and you, these two little trams pull you, you know, because you just, everything, all the power's up and everything. Was it something that you could be interested in because of its... Oh, Panama, yeah, it was Panama Canal. I, even though I, you weren't feeling... Yeah, I didn't, oh, we, we were feeling pretty good there, okay. we were in good shape then. I could yeah. walk around and stuff like that, yeah. except they had a cast on and that. But uh, it was interesting going through those locks. It took us a whole day, and or even longer than I think. It only takes about a ship a day, you know. Very slow because that water's got to fill up. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they fill it up, then they open the lock, you know, and then you go into the next one. <laughs> yeah, and they they pull they pull the big ship along with trams on the side, you know. So we get through there and we're going along, and all of a sudden we finally saw land, <laughs> and we ended up in Newport News, Newport News, Virginia. Virginia. Right. And they had just I was reading that bulletin that they gave us that that, that had been changed over from a, uh, some kind of a 
camp or something for kids, children, or something like that. They made it into an army. Army had taken it over. They made it into a hospital. Yeah, that was nice. It was nice. They were good to us. And how long were you at the hospital there? We landed there in, uh, let's see, March, April. I think it was the first part of June, I think we landed there. When you camp, It was Camp, Pat camp Patrick Henry, they called it. Newport News, Virginia. When you were hit, you mentioned that you were with a gentleman and then there were two others on the other hmm. side. Yeah. And you thought that some of them were hit. I never saw them. You never saw them I never again. saw them again, no, mm -hmm. not them. So I don't know what happened. Were you able to maintain close friendships in your... Yes, we were, yeah. They were, at that time, we were, they were from all over the country, mm -hmm. all over the United States. After you got out of the service then, did you keep in contact with some yes, of them? Yes, I did, yeah, I kept in contact with some. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had, we had a 54th meeting up in uh, Lewiston, Maine, just last week. Well, the 15th, it was the last week, that's right, sadly. And there were still a hundred of us there with, you know, wives or whatever. And there were two or three of us at the same table that were in my outfit, the headquarters company. And uh, did you overseas. remember any of them, or were they? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, we kept in contact for the last 10 years, anyhow. That's great. We've been meeting at the, well, when I first started to go there, they, they, uh, there were more of us, but some of them have died since then, you know. And uh, so it gets gets smaller every year. But and their, their slogan is uh, "To the last man." I think you noted yeah. it on your hat. I have it on correct? my hat. I have it on my hat here. That's right. You so also to, brought so in your man, jacket yeah. and your um, purple heart and your, yes. your one of your badges. Would yes, you like sir. to show those yeah, too? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a purple heart. Does your family understand the seriousness of that medal? Or do you Who, not? My family? Yeah. Oh, yes. Because mm -hmm. my brother-in-law got one, too. He got hit in the NGO as he got off the ship. Yeah. Why don't you show the jacket, too? Yeah, right. Um, you can put the hat down. Yeah, this is the patch. Why don't That's you? the 43rd patch, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's and a, it's a uh, maple leaf on a red border, yeah. And if you show the jacket, yeah. which also has the maple leaf on it. Yeah, right. I don't think I can get into that now. <laughs> <laughs> I gained a little weight. <laughs> it's in great condition. Yeah, well, I put it away. This is the, that's how long you, you know, that each one of those is like a year or whatever it is. Yeah. So you were in for three? Almost three, yeah. 20 something months. Yeah. Most, so were of, you most of it overseas. <laughs> and were you discharged from the Virginia area? No, I wasn't. No, they're supposed to send us closest Army hospitals, you know, which would have been Fort Devens. And were you? I mean, I lived in Marlboro. Right. No, I wasn't. I was sent to Camp Edwards, way down the Cape. On the Cape. Buzzards Bay, right. Mm -hmm. Yep. I was still in the hospital at that time. Have you had any um, repercussions from your injury? Over the years, I had, a, I had a couple problems with the urinary tract a couple times. Yeah. And is the service still helping you, the veterans? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't been back to the veterans for about nine years now. I go locally. I worked for the Veterans Administration Hospital for thirty six years. Yeah. So, tell us then. You were discharged from Camp Edwards. And then you came home. Your family uh, was aware that you had been injured. Did they? Oh, oh, yeah. They got a telegram, but that was all followed up too. In what way? <laughs> My sister was getting married the 21st of April. They received the telegram on the 20th of April, which said that I had been wounded in the leg. You know, and it wasn't the leg at all. <laughs> it was a kidney in the hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so that kind of threw a kibosh in the wedding. A little bit, not much. Did she go? Did she get gonna, married this year? If Sunday? I got back at, back home, I was going to be in a wedding party. Yeah, but uh, well, I had written from the hospitals and all that. I told them, you know, it wasn't the leg. I told them what it was. I couldn't write because I'm right-handed, so I had a Red Cross worker write. I dictated to her what she asked me, you know, whatever what she wanted to, her to write, and I'd tell her, you know. After a while, I did try writing left-handed, which which wasn't too good, but.
Do you write left-handed now? No, I don't. You no. write with your right I hand, still even though you right still hand. have the yes, image. Yes, I can. Yeah, I, yeah. And I then, do everything with my right hand, but it's you know, it's not like it wasn't wasn't hit or anything yeah. like that. Yeah, I still do it. Everything is still right-handed. So then, when you came home and you were discharged, did you take some time off? Uh, I was discharged at 10, 11, 45. And I came home, and after eight or nine days at home, of course, I had stopped taking the Yadabrin. I came down with malaria. I was supposed to be in the wedding party. And that got me mad. <laughs> so at that time, Cushing Hospital was under the VA at that time. It went from Miami to the VA, Cushing Hospital in Framingham. So my mother called up the hospital, they sent an ambulance. I said, I got malaria. I said, never had it before because I stopped taking the adamant, you know, when you come home. I never had it there. I was turning yellow, my eyes were yellow. I was cold, I was warm, you know, back and forth. So finally they called, this young doctor comes and he says, uh, what's wrong? <laughs> I said, I got malaria. I said, how do you know? I said, well, my eyes are all yellow. I said, and I'm hot and I'm cold and, you know. He said, okay. So they take me out. I, they were going to take me. To, they wanted me to put a stretcher. I said, "I can walk out." I walked out of the house and they put me in the ambulance. You know, they take me to Cushing. I get to Cushing in Hospital in Framingham. And of course, it's under the VA now, so I'm in the service in the army. I'm on leave. <laughs> so uh, no, that was yeah, that was after I could, no, I was on leave. That's right. When I got the malaria. So what did they take me? They didn't. <laughs> they wouldn't keep me there. They shipped me down to Waltham Army Hospital in Waltham with malaria. I wasn't the only one there to have malaria either. So I got there and they give me a cart and they, they take all this mesh and tuck it under it. What good is that going to do? The mosquitoes here I got to bother you. I got it already, you know. So I was there. Oh, I was sick. Was there any concern also about the fact that you only had one kidney? Not really, no. Mm -hmm. Not really. But I'm going to tell you something that's really not funny really, but my sister went in for an operation about five years ago or something, I forget what it was, in the stomach or something, and they, they noticed that she did not have a left kidney. And they said she was born with it. Not, she was 74, I think, at the time. And, and she never knew. And she never knew. So they did something to hook up the right one, you know, but it was functioning, but she was having problems, you know, so they put a, a shunt or something, I don't know what you call it. But she never knew it. All this, she was 74, at least. This was four or five years ago. That's amazing. And she never had a problem, you know. And I lost my right one, gunshot wound. And she, she didn't even have one. Very it's, ironic. It is, isn't it? Yeah. One was the right, one was the left. Sure. Yeah. Then what? Yeah. What you mentioned working for the VA? Yes, I did. Uh, was it soon after you got out of the service that you? Well, it was about four years. Mm-hmm. I I took some courses to uh, Franklin Institute in Boston, New York correspondence, you know, in between. And then I, there was a job opened up in the uh, message center in the uh, mail room at Cushing. At the time it was under the VA, so I applied for it and I got the job. <laughs> so I worked in there in the mail room and uh, for a couple of years we sorted the mail when it came in. They brought the mail from the Framingham Post Office. We sorted the mail and, and we also delivered all the mail and stuff to the, all the wards. There were three or, three or four of us. We all had a different section. Mm -hmm. And we just carried around the bag, you know, like a mailman. And we picked up mail in. Whatever they had, we picked up and brought back and sorted it out for where it's going to go, you know, to other patients or mail that was going out or whether from one part of the hospital, you know, to, uh, to the director or the manager, mm -hmm. they call them at that time, or to another doctor or something in another section. I, I had the section which was the medical section, which had also had a woman's ward. One, one ward was all woman, and uh, I had the psychiatric section. <laughs> you had to be very careful because everything was locked up there. They had maybe a couple of people with them, and they unlocked the door. When they did that, they locked it right up, and all the, all the patients would get up against the wall, you know, and I'd walk down between them and deliver stuff. Now, were there a lot of patients in that ward from oh, from oh, the war? Oh yeah, they were all from the war. Yeah. And was it was it that they just couldn't cope with some of the experiences that they had? Or? Yeah, right. Too traumatic for some of them. Yeah, right. The nerves, nerves shatter and stuff. You know, 
you could hear them screaming, some of them in the, you know, some of them were in these locked rooms, they, you could hear them screaming, they banged their heads, they had them padded, you know, a lot of them banged their heads against the wall and stuff. And uh, I remember one time, it was the summertime, they had doors on the end, you know, and sometimes they didn't lock them, you know, somebody would be standing or something. I remember this one patient, when I was delivering the mail, he took and he, uh, he ran right, that, right outside, right out through the screen door, didn't even open it, <laughs> ran right through it. <laughs> They got yeah. him though and brought him back. Yeah. yeah, they got him. Yeah, they brought him back. Sure. And did you finish off your job with the VA in doing mail service, or did no, you? No, I do didn't. No. What else? I did was you do there. Then? I was in that only a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then I moved to another section, which was they called at that time was the registrar section, which was the admitting office, the admitted patients, discharged patients. They had insurance, prosthetics, and orthotics. Uh, Eligibility, claims examiner, insurance. We took care of, you know, when they come in and when they went out and all that stuff. Having been. They care of their records, you know. That. Having been a patient, mm -hmm. do you think that you offered a different um, thought process in that admissions process than someone who maybe hadn't been through what you'd been through? Oh, yeah, because they, you know, I saw a lot of them. You know, they were wounded in, that, in, the, in the service. And uh, then, of course, when I was in hospital myself, you know, and uh, we, you know, we, of course, we didn't have family come and visit us. We were down in, the flower, uh, in the Virginia, you know, until Camp Edwards, which was close by, you know. And, uh, but we, we made friends with a lot of the people, the fellows that were in the, in the hospital, you know. Mm -hmm. We got to know each other. and. Mm -hmm. In fact, one time, and, and lady, when I <coughs> excuse me, when I was in the hospital, lady, all of a sudden, this, I saw this aide coming down, this uh, core man, and he looks at me and he says, "Joe Champagne, what are you doing here?" <laughs> there was one of my neighbors lived in Marlboro. In Marlboro. <laughs> yeah. So did you see a lot of him while you were there? Yeah, I did. After, yeah. Uh, after we, you know, he knew I was there. He so was that had he to was help surprised. a bit. Huh? Yeah, it did. And I used to get the local papers, you know, in the mail, so I got that and. Then letters and and packages and stuff like that from home. How how important? What was? What do you think was your greatest challenge in your war services? Uh, I don't know. It's probably you know. Not wanting to kill anybody, but you had to, or mm -hmm. if they got you, one or the other, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, if you didn't fire first, or you didn't, you know, if they're crawling around in the, even, in the evening and night, I mean, if you didn't get them, they get you. Do you think it was you know? important for you to be in the service? Yeah, I think so at that time, yeah, World War II, yeah, because, uh, I mean, we wanted to get freedom again, you know, I mean, the Japanese just snuck up on us, you know, Pearl Harbor. And, and you're... Uh, I thought of it, you know, that's why I tried to enlist with the other fellows, you know, at first, but, and somebody had to do it, you know. I was mm -hmm. still young at that time. And, and do you, how do you feel it affected you in your life and in, in your working with the VA and raising your daughter? I, I think it helped uh, because, uh, you know, it gave you a experience. You had to make quick decisions on what to do. Uh, you made, you learned how to make friends, and uh, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of things. I mean, it showed how to be responsible and uh, you know help people out. Oops. Help people out if you, uh, you know, need help, like anybody that was wounded like that, you know. And as you're going along, you know, you see somebody, you, you couldn't really do much for them. Some of them you call for the medics, you know, they would take care of them. Uh, they tried to help them, but good, but you didn't have that much time, you know. Yeah. Well, one of the questions that we ask um, other veterans, and I'd like to ask you now, is your feeling about the difference of public opinion regarding veterans during your period of time, World War II, versus mm -hmm. those who fought in the Korean conflict and those in Vietnam? Yeah. I'll, 
Uh, I know there isn't much mention of World War II anymore. I don't even know if they have it in high school. I don't even know if they even mention it. I know they talk about the Vietnam War, they talk about Korea, they talk about the Gulf War, you know, that kind of stuff. In my opinion, as far as Vietnam, I don't think we should have even been there. Because when I was working in the VA hospital in West Roxbury, they were bringing in patients from, from there, and uh, that went on, went on for 10 years, which was, you know, a waste of, waste of people, you know? I took care of people with their legs off, their arms off, paralyzed from the waist down, quadriplegic from the neck down, couldn't move, couldn't do nothing. That was about, that was part of my job too, prosthetics and orthotics. I was buying, I was buying wheelchairs for the patients. I was buying beds. I was buying artificial limbs, artificial arms. I was buying uh, eyes, cosmetic eyes, uh, tracheotomies, you know, so they could speak. You know, these uh, special speakers and stuff like that. Those had lost their voice, you know, and stuff like that. And I bought, uh, I used to buy all kinds of things for them. For their, uh, uh, what do you call it? I bought shoes, elastic, elastic holes. We had an orthotic shop which did some of that work too. They they fit them for elastic supports, stuff like that. They also made temporary limbs, mm -hmm. and we handled all of that. That kind of all prosthetics, anything at all, no matter what it was. If somebody had a bad bad foot or something, they made a a shoe, you know, so that foot would fit in right and so they'd be comfortable. They made braces for the, some of the paras, paraplegics that they put the braces on so that they'd bend so they could walk along. You know, someone could walk if somebody helped them, you know, or along the bars, you know. Having and, uh, been a wounded veteran and now working with another generation of wounded veterans, did right. you see a major difference in their wounds versus what you Oh, were yes, part it, was, of? it was a little different, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially in Vietnam, you know. In fact, uh, they, they even brought some Cubans in there. Cubans were in the Vietnam War. They had to get special permission from the Secretary of State's office in Washington because we had to pay for that, you know. And uh, so we gave them everything, though. We gave them wheelchairs and leg braces and anything they needed, you know, because, well, we were paying for it anyhow. Everybody was, all the Americans, <laughs> mm -hmm. somehow or other by taxes or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So we took care of them. Uh, and we also had some uh, people that come in, young people, uh, female, male, that were injured. And I remember one young girl, she was doing gymnastics or something, and when she landed, she missed the mat. She landed on the hard floor, and she got paralyzed. And they brought her in. She was like 16 years old, I think. Now, did they bring and her in because of the expertise yeah, right. of the people at the right, hospital? Yeah. It was a paraplegic and spinal, it was a spinal cord center for paraplegics, quadriplegics. We had also had medical, surgical, orthopedic, GU, mm -hmm. you know, the whole. I mean, we also had uh, corrective therapy, uh, PT, physical therapy, and all that kind of stuff. We had everything for them. That was the center. That's what Cushing was at the time, too, that when we moved. Cushing was a hospital in Framingham. In that, Framingham. That right. is yeah. now closed down. It's closed, well, it's, I think the state still has it, I think. Mm -hmm. In fact, the state bought it for a dollar, I think, off of the Army. Of uh, the VA, I'm sorry. And I noticed in the paper just the other day that they opened up the chapel there again. Yes, I did read yeah. that. In it fact, they mentioned a patient, uh, one of the fellows there, Mr. Dale, Frank Dale. I remember working with him. And he was in the Marines. He was a colonel, lieutenant colonel or colonel. And I saw his name in the paper there. I think he was married there at that station, I think. So at, you are a gentleman who, throughout your adult life, have been involved in one way or another with all of the wars with that have gone right. on because of your work with the Veterans yeah, Services. That's, that's right, yeah. That's right. 36 years, yeah. Yeah. In closing, is there a thought or a memory or even just a comment that you'd like to share, not only with your family who will be seeing this, but with those who may in the future be doing some research on the world wars, um, maybe future generations coming into this library or looking on our website? No, I, 
I think uh, they should know what the war was all about. Now, of course, they knew what it was about, but I mean, you know, what went on during the war. You know, they were stateside here, and uh, of course, they always we always kept in contact as much as possible. You know, through mail and, and the local newspapers would say just together every once in a while when they caught up to me, <laughs> and uh, I know they were back here praying and stuff like that. You know the water get over so you know everybody gets through it as good shape as possible and they, they made it uh, like now I mean now they show the wars and stuff right on TV now you know they show them bombing these places and shooting these people and everything you know at that time they didn't have that you know one day my little my grandson was about 10 and, and my granddaughter they says uh, Grampy, what did you watch on television? And I looked at him and I said, television? And I says, hey, we were lucky to have a radio back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how, how bad, badly we were off. We never had a car. Mm -hmm. My mother and father never had a car. You know, I had to depend on other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just couldn't afford them at that time, you know? Hey, we used to go to the store and we used to charge a pound of hamburg with a quarter. Couldn't even pay for that. You used mm -hmm. to put on the bill. Used to pay pay the pay the store so much when you could, you know. Not like nowadays. You get down and you buy pound of hamburgers, three dollars or something like that. And the newspapers fifty cents. I used, I used to peddle newspapers with two cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people couldn't even pay you for that, <laughs> you know. And uh, well, for a gentleman yeah. who's been through quite a bit of experiences, not only in your war, but in the VA after that. You, you are remarkable. No, I, I, I try to stay in good shape. I mean, I, my wife and I try to go walking as often as possible. We used to go walking in the cemetery mm -hmm. down in Natick here, St. Pat's, because it's nice and flat. We said, nobody bothers you, you know? Sure. Well, we'd like to thank you. <laughs> well, we see you. a lot of people there, though. And thank you this afternoon yeah. for coming in to stay yeah. with us. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, John.